Hi, it's Gary, and welcome back to the workshop. It's good to have you here. In episode 13, I talked about thinning solid tops and trying to get the right flexibility to get the right sound. And in this episode, by extension, I'm going to tell you how I do the same type of work for double tops, which is the type of guitar that I primarily build. Many of you might know that a double top is actually a three-layered type of construction that's a composite sandwich. And I think the best example of what the design is like is corrugated cardboard. And you know that corrugated cardboard, it's just paper, but can be extremely stiff for its weight. Even though the three components that it's composed of are two sheets of paper on the outside which are thin and very flexible and some kind of core, some kind of matrix that is also very light and flexible. But when you glue them all together, it's like forming I-beams all across this matrix and you get something that's very strong yet light. And the idea is to, for guitars, to make a top that's strong and light or at least the same strength that you would have in a solid top but reduce the weight and in theory that would increase the power of the guitar and increase the speed of response and that's generally what people have observed in in double top guitars. Well double tops have been around for about 30 years since the pioneering work of Matthias Dahmann and Gernot Wagner in Germany and they've become quite popular by many players in 30 years down the road. And unfortunately, while they are popular among players and builders, there's not a lot of information. There's some information out there on how to make a double top guitar. And if you want to start your reading on that, I suggest you read Randy Reynolds' groundbreaking article on the subject, which was published in 2006 in American Luthery by the Guild of American Luthiers. In this article, he shares the technique which was generously taught to him by Gernot Wagner, who originally conceived the idea of constructing composite sandwiches with Nomex cores and brought them into the mainstream that we know today. I have built double top guitars since 2010, and I've used cores of Nomex, Cedar, and most recently Balsa, and using veneers of cedar and spruce. So just like in this corrugated cardboard model, instead of having paper, you would have thin veneers of regular soundboard material, but thinning them on the order of 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters, and then have a core that's either um, an aerospace honeycomb called Nomex or some kind of wood like balsa. And the wood cores can be treated in many different ways. You can have slats, you can have holes, and I'll show you my design that I use for balsa cores. Okay, so just like um, any kind of soundboard structure, you want to be able to manage the flexibility to get it so that it can produce sound that is not only powerful and resonant, but also have the suppleness and richness that you want. And so as we discussed in episode 13 for solid tops, the same needs to be done for double tops. And in fact, because the nature of the design often leads to high rigidity, the, the trick for building a good sounding double top is actually to make it quite flexible. And so we'll talk more about that. So I'm going to show you how I build a, a double top and then use the methods that we talked about in the last episode to measure and monitor their flexibility. Because I found that in making these new structures and combining different materials is very critical to be able to measure the flexibility and correlate that to sound and by having um, references to the flexibility in terms of numbers, it makes it very easy to either duplicate the sound that you want 
or move the sound in, a, in the direction that you want by altering the flexibility. So we'll talk about that. So I hope this helps you if you want to get into building double tops or just from a theoretical standpoint of how you would think about building new structures using new materials and using flexibility monitoring to your advantage. So let's head over to the workbench now and get started. In episode 13, I showed you how I thin solid top soundboards in order to increase its flexibility to get the right sound and how I monitor that flexibility through the construction process using a device. And in today's video, I'm going to take a departure from that theme and show you how I make double top soundboards. And they vary quite a bit from a solid top in that while I want to get the same flexibility as I use in a solid top soundboard, the construction itself, which is composed of very thin veneers on the order of 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters in thickness, when you glue that together in this sandwich construction, there's no way that you can remove material from the inside veneer or off of the outside veneer in order to increase the flexibility. So what I'll show you is that the flexibility is controlled solely by the thickness of the core, and in this case, I'm going to use balsa. So I've got three components of this sandwich construction. On the outside, I'll have a spruce veneer, and in the middle, I like to use a design that has holes machined by CNC Robotics in this core of balsa. And then I'm going to wrap it together with an inside veneer of cedar. So I'm going to mix the characteristics tonally and responsively, uh, mix the, those characteristics of spruce and cedar to give a very nice mix of sound and response. All right, so the first order of business is that I need to start making this sandwich and I build them inside out. So I'm going to first make a veneer of cedar, and in this case, this is more like four millimeters thick, and I need to thin it to 0.5 millimeters on the drum sander. So let's go do that now. So now I have my veneer of cedar and I'm going to glue that to this balsa core in a vacuum bag. Here's the inner cedar veneer at 0.5 millimeters thick and you can see it's very flexible but surprisingly not brittle. I'll glue it to the balsa core, which is end grain balsa purchased from a specialty balsa company, and they sell a lot of material to model airplane makers. At this stage, the balsa is still at its raw thickness. I'll apply polyurethane glue to the balsa with a plate transfer procedure. For convenience during cleanup, I'll first cover the acrylic plate with clear adhesive film. This is the kind that's used by movers and painters to stick to floors and carpets so that they don't get dirty. You can buy rolls of this at hardware stores. Here I'm applying 12 grams of pre-weighed polyurethane glue and spreading it evenly with the roller.
Then I'll press the balsa whole side down into the glue, making sure every bit of surface receives the adhesive. After lifting the balsa, I'll check the pattern of glue left behind to make sure there are no voids. Then I'll place this layup balsa side up onto a flat board and then into the vacuum bag where it will cure for two hours. I'll often glue up to three of these assemblies at a time. And now I have what I call a half assembly where I have the cedar veneer, which will be on the inside of the soundboard glued to this balsa core. And you can see that as I start to thin this, it will expose those holes that you saw earlier. At this point in the procedure, I need to pause to give you the most critical values regarding core thickness and sandwich flexibility as measured by deflection. And these values will ensure the tonal success of the eventual sandwich. In contrast to a solid top soundboard where we simply thin a plate from the exterior, the procedure for a double top is to thin the core to a thickness that will give the correct flexibility once the outer veneer is glued. Similar to what I showed you in episode 13, these are my deflection targets for the completed double top sandwich. 0.220 inches in the width grain direction and 0.200 inches in the cross grain direction. Both of these targets have allowances of up to 10% in either direction. And for my system, based on my experience, the target thickness of the core that will achieve this is a uniform 0.65 to 0.70 millimeters. Now for comparison, these numbers are slightly different from those I showed you in the last episode for a solid top soundboard. And you can see that for a double top sandwich, the deflection numbers are higher in the top line, meaning that I want the double top sandwich to be more flexible. After we finish building the double top sandwich, I'll talk in detail about the core thickness, flexibility of the sandwich, and why the numbers are different from that of a solid top plate. Now let's continue by thinning the balsa core to the prescribed thickness.
I've just used the drum sander to slowly thin the balsa cord to the correct thickness. And for me, that correct thickness is between 0.65 and 0.70 millimeters. And that's based solely on experience that when I do all my operations and make this sandwich and measure it on the device, that will give me the right flexibility that will give me the sound that I'm after. Now I measure the height of the balsa bed using a caliper like this one from Luthier's Mercantile, which conveniently fits in the holes of my balsa bed. But you could use a regular caliper and just monitor the depth of your balsa. Now, in this stage, you can see that it's very flexible still. And that will become stiffer when I take the outer veneer and glue it to this half assembly. And that will essentially form an I-beam that locks in all the structural elements. If you're going to make a double top sandwich, the depth of your core is going to differ from mine based on many different factors, such as the core material, such as is it going to be Nomex, is it going to be balsa, and what kind of orientation of your balsa is it going to be? Is it going to be in holes? Is it going to be in slats, at diagonals? You name it. And then what type and amount of adhesive are you going to use? Is it going to be polyurethane like I use, or is it going to be epoxy? The thickness and stiffness of your veneer will add or subtract stiffness. So based on how thick you go with and what kind of material, that will change things. And then what is the nature of your bracing? How much bracing, how stiff, and what is the distribution? And then also, how much doming that you're going to introduce into your soundboard. Is it going to be a lot of doming? Let's say 25 foot of radius, which is going to be stiffer than let's say 28 feet of radius. Most of these variables will be set according to your design, but in terms of the construction of the sandwich, the core's thickness is the most practical variable that you can adjust to optimize its mechanical and acoustic properties. And as I showed you in episode 13, Thickness has a profound influence on the stiffness of plates. Therefore, the key message is that you want to control sandwich flexibility by controlling core thickness. So when you're developing your double top sandwich, it's going to take a lot of diligence and probably a lot of iterations to get it right. And I just encourage you to try to be as precise and accurate in your processes and take a lot of notes so you know where you've been. Now let's finish this double top sandwich by gluing the outer spruce veneer to the half assembly. And when I do this, I'm going to use a work board that has a 28 foot radius in the lower bout. And then it has this ramp in the upper bout, which will give a fall away for the elevated fingerboard design that I use. And when I glue them together, I'm going to build it upside down, so I'm going to put the outer veneer down on the dish and then put the half assembly, which will have the inside, the bracing will go on this face, over the spruce. The procedure for gluing the outside veneer is the same as that for the inner. The only difference is that I use the workboard to introduce doming.
Okay, the sandwich top has been under vacuum for two hours, so let's turn off the pump and see what we've got. So unlike before where we just had veneers of the half assembly, now it has some rigidity. And it also has some nice flexibility in the different axes too. A lot of mobility, but it has integrity. And then we introduce doming into the lower bout, which you can see. And then a fall away in the upper bout to incorporate the elevated fingerboard. Let me take another brief pause to show you an accounting of the thicknesses and weights of the sandwich components and final measured thickness and weight. You can stop the video if you want to take a closer look. So just like we did in episode 13 for a solid top, let's go ahead and measure the deflection. Now we've come to the moment of truth where we get to test the flexibility of this double top plate. And I'm going to use the deflection rig that I showed you how to make in episode 13 and where I used it to measure the flexibility of a solid top. If you want to go back and review that episode, you can. I'm going to start by taking the deflection in the width grain direction. I'm going to preload with the 180 gram weight to get everything settled. Then zero the dial indicator, and then load with the two pound weight. And the reading is 0.228 inches. And let's shift the orientation to measure the cross grain direction. In this case, the cross grain is always more flexible, so we use lower weights. So I'll preload with a 30 gram weight. Zero the dial indicator and then load with this 180 gram weight. And the measurement is 0.19 inches. These deflection numbers look really good and I think we nailed our target flexibility. So let's take a look at the actual numbers again compared to that of solid tops and then wrap up by talking about some special properties of these double top plates. Looking at the deflection values I just measured for the double top sandwich and comparing them to those of the solid top plate from episode 13, you can see that the double top is significantly more flexible in the width grain direction. And while the thicknesses are on the same order, you can see a 27% weight savings in the double top. I'll show you the bracing and brace carving steps in a future video. But let me just mention that both types of plates were designed to be used in conjunction with fan bracing and doming with a 28-foot radius. Here's where things get really fun when we hear the tap tones coming from this double top plate. And really interesting when we compare it to the solid top that I prepared for you in episode 13. So let's start by listening first in a very qualitative way and then we'll get more sophisticated later. But on first listening, I'd like you to listen not so much for the pitches, but more the quality of the sound in terms of things like clarity and sustain. So here is the sound of the double top plate.
and compare that to the solid top. What did you think you heard? I think for the solid top, I hear more filtering in it compared to the double top, which has a more glassy, clear, sustaining quality. Now, no judgments here on what is going to make a better guitar. I think they'll just be different, but I think this filtering effect that we hear in the solid top is what I love about solid top guitars in that they can have a very refined and supple sound, especially in older guitars where they really get nice and smooth. Whereas for the double tops, that sustain and vibrancy, I think, leads to some very responsive type of guitars with very good sustain. Now let's get more sophisticated and listen for the pitches that are the products of the resonances that are inherent in the plate. And after all, as builders, we're trying to steer the resonances through the whole construction process to ultimately arrive at the voice that uh, we want. So let's listen for the collection of pitches that we should hear in the tap. And as I've mentioned in episode nine, it's really a whole envelope of resonances that we're going to be able to hear as pitches. And often my brain can only discern a couple of prominent peaks at any time. And uh, while I can hear lower frequency pitches, I'm only able to really pinpoint a couple. So why don't you see what you can hear? So let's start with the double top plate. And in my brain and ear, I can only pick out a couple main pitches, which sound like this in pure tone. Listen again. Now here's the solid top. And I mainly hear this pure tone. Off the bat, I can tell that they do sound different from one another, but it's going to take some spectral analysis to actually see what all the resonances look like. So let's use Visual Analyzer and do some impulse um, analysis to let the microphone and the computer tell us what the resonant pitches look like. For the impulse analysis, I'm exciting the plate at multiple points with the hammer to activate as many modes of vibration as possible. This will encourage the full representation of resonant peaks. If you'd like to learn how to use impulse analysis, I highly recommend you refer to the exceptional book by Trevor Gore and Gerard Gillet. Looking at the impulse spectra for the double top sandwich in the top panel and the solid top plate in the lower panel, I can see the resonance peaks for the pitches I heard the most. 117 and 230 hertz for the double top and 255 hertz for the solid top. But look at all these other peaks that my brain couldn't resolve. Now if I'm interested in consistency of voice between guitars made from these two tops, I want to try to match the resonant peaks, particularly in the lower frequency range that you can see over here on the left. All in all, I think the two plates are very reasonably well matched, especially considering that the double top is a completely different construction. They're not going to be exact, but they are still pretty close. And what I found is that if I'm interested in consistency of voice between guitars made from these two tops, I want to try to match the resonant peaks, particularly in the lower frequency range. And you can see in the lower frequency range, they're pretty decently matched. Granted, the resonances will change when I brace the tops and attach them to the sides, but the resonances that we observe now inform us about the physical properties of the plates 
which will still have just as much influence even when we start adding more structure. So thinking about the flexibility measurements that I shared with you earlier, there's a couple of reasons why they are what they are. The first one is those are the flexibilities that were arrived at empirically over years of development time. And those are the flexibilities that gave me guitars whose sound was the sound that I was after. And then later as I added a double top model, I wanted those double tops to sound like they came from the same maker. And so I wanted to try to match the voice between double top and solid top. And so by kind of co-evolution, those flexibilities were arrived at for double tops. Now, you might have the big question of, then why is it that the flexibilities for the double top plates are so much higher than those of the solid top? And if you remember in episode seven, I shared with you a fundamental principle that pitches are proportional to the stiffness of a plate divided by its weight. And knowing that a double top plate is 25% lighter, then I would have to compensate higher flexibility to make the resonant pitches low enough so that they would match those of the solid top. So that's essentially what we observed by this exercise where we were trying to build two types of tops that would ultimately give guitars that sound similar. And we've come full circle now, and I think the take-home message is if you're interested in controlling sound and gaining consistency, then trying to control the resonances and get the resonances similar between, let's say, a spruce top to another spruce top or a spruce top to a cedar top or even as extreme as one type of solid top to a double top, try to match the resonances and use flexibility as a tool to control those resonances. I'd like to end now by telling you about some unusual properties that I've observed with double tops that I think gives them some very special qualities. And I think a lot of it stems from the fact that they are extremely elastic. So look at all the mobility that you can get in different directions with this structure. And in fact, if I did the same with this amount of torque on a solid top, it would likely crack if it had the same strength just because solid wood tends to be brittle, especially along grain lines. But double top, since we're creating this new type of species or structure, it has this continuity to it in continuity of stiffness in many directions, whereas solid uh, pieces of wood tend to have very directional because of the grain. So this kind of continuity with a given amount of strength has some unique properties I think as far as having the structural integrity to re resist um, the pull of the strings yet at the same time have very high mobility and I think what this allows is that you have a lot of degrees of freedom for different resonant modes to set up with high efficiency. And I think what this does is extend the resonant range of the top so that it's very possible to have the flexibility to give you a very low um, base range so that you get the richness of a low-pitched guitar, yet at the same time be able to support with high efficiency some of these high register modes that require a lot of movement of the top to set up different sectors on the plate to resonate at higher frequencies. And we'll talk more about how these modes of vibration work in later videos. But this elasticity 
also makes what should seem like a very fragile structure because the veneers are very, very thin. But because you have a core that ties everything together, the whole structure behaves more like ripstop nylon. So I've actually experienced players who have had accidents where they, they've punctured a double top with, let's say, a music stand, and whereas that would easily shatter and produce a crack along a grain line on a solid top, on a double top, it just remained a puncture in that very localized area, and that was it, and then it could easily be repaired. So that, these are just some anecdotal things that tell me that it's this type of plasticity that gives it a very unique type of tonal quality as well as kind of longevity. And since double tops have been around 30 years now and we haven't seen a lot of catastrophic failures that might have been predicted 30 years back, um, I think it bodes well for at least mid-range longevity of these double tops. Now we talked a lot about managing the flexibility and doing that gives you quite a bit of advantage in controlling the sound. And I made a comment in the previous um, episode that if you are able to manage the flexibility in the plate, by the time you have that right and by the time that you get to bracing, bracing becomes a lot less important than we often think about how bracing should work. And I've noticed this on double tops that I make the flexibility in both axes similar on different um, plates. And then I can actually brace these, say, two plates with a completely different bracing scheme shown here and get practically the identical voice in the two guitars. So it means that if you do your diligence early on and build the flexibility correctly in your tops, then bracing becomes more of a fine-tuning mechanism and less so of something that should really change the voice in any major way. So these are some of the mechanical and acoustic properties that I've noticed. And in a future video, though, I'll have some commentary on what the players have to say, I think, um, regarding solid top versus double top. And I don't think there's uh, one better type of design that are just different. And for different players, I think they're, they are suited uh, more for one type of player than another. But I think nowadays people keeping an open mind being a very from a very traditional background have often found a home with a double top guitar. So I hope you found this video helpful and at least might um, help you approach your building of whatever style top in a more rational way and hopefully cut down maybe some development time off of um, your guitars. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video and back in the workshop with me.